All right. Feeling better? Yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit hoarse, but feeling <laughs> a lot better than the last couple of days. All right, Wes was out of commission, but he, he's got healthy, <laughs> took the vitamin C. Yeah. You're ready to rock and roll. He's glad it's from home and he didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, man, well, I'll let you uh, take it away. Awesome. Can you, you see my screen and everything okay? Yep. I can hear you and I can see the screen. So I think we're good. Beautiful. Um, all right. Let's kick it off. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in to your computer. Uh, you didn't really come on out. Or I guess if you're at one of the, the viewing parties, you are. Uh, my talk today is going to be on <clears throat> what's new in React. I know a lot of you are, uh, are Vue developers or, or just back-end PHP developers, but uh, I think especially after uh, that last talk where they talked about how, how to go asynchronous in PHP, um, I thought that was kind of funny because in JavaScript, we're often, often battling, and specifically in React, we're battling like, how do you make it synchronous-ish in, in JavaScript? And, and how do we, since everything is asynchronous in, in JavaScript, um, how do we fight some of these problems and how do we solve these problems? So. Uh, I'm excited to talk about some of the new stuff in React that uh, specifically targets how to do a sync data fetching. Um, so my name is Wes Boss. I'm from Canada. Um, I'm primarily a JavaScript developer. I don't know why they keep inviting me back uh, to, to speak at all these PHP conferences, but uh, hopefully you learn a thing or two. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, the slides are going to be available at, uh, at Wes Boss on Twitter if you want a link to this after um, after uh, after I speak, um, <clears throat> if if you haven't seen any of my stuff before, I make web development courses um, primarily on JavaScript. I've got one on ES6, one on React, one on Node. Uh, I've got a bunch of free ones on JavaScript 30, CSS Grid, um, a whole bunch of other ones. If you're interested, you can find the links on my website, westboss.com. Um, I also have a podcast that uh, we have weekly, and it's kind of uh, we talk about web development in general. Um, back-end, front-end, uh, soft skills related things, so you might find that useful as well. Um, this talk today is about what's new in React and how everything you know is going to be useless in two months. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of joking about that. Uh, sort of the joke in, in React world is that uh, everything just churns so quickly and, and, and whatnot. And uh, the, the stuff that we're learning today is uh, they're just ad addressing current React pain. So, um, what I really like about these, specifically hooks and suspense, they are making both our lives as developers easier, as well as the actual people who use our websites. It's going to make the experience uh, better, more performant, all those happy things. So we're going to talk about context fragments, error boundaries, the new refs API portals, and then the two big ones are uh, suspense and hooks. Uh, those are the big ones that have been coming to React. So let's get into it. First one is context. Um, Context has been around in React for, um, I don't know, a couple of years now, um, but we have a new API for, for how Context works. Um, so to explain what Context is, uh, React Context allows you to pass down data multiple levels without the need to pass uh, data, data through props at each level. So sort of a problem that we have uh, right now in, in React or, or that you can run into is that uh, if you have data at a high level and you need data at a lower level, or if you have like functionality, like what happens when you click a button, how do you fetch data, and you need that functionality at a lower level, like um, like how do you do that right now? Um, and the, the current the way is you could use like an external platform like Redux, or you could just pass it down through props. Uh, but Context aims to to solve that. So here's a problem. Let's say I have an app component and inside of my render. Um, I have a person that lives inside of my app component and I want to pass that person down to family. Well, you pass it down via a prop called person. Uh, and then you're inside a family and you also want to pass that person down one more level. Well, you, you pass it down via prop. Um, and then inside of that person, you finally get to, to go ahead and, and use that data. Um, this is what is referred to lovingly as called prop drilling, where you're passing down data, passing down functionality, um, one by one. And React is, is designed to actually do this by default. The, the whole idea behind React is that you're making these small little components that you pass data into. And as long as this data is passed into the component by whatever means, then that component can live by itself. And it's not very 
um, it's it's not going to rely on higher level components. So that's sort of by design in React. However, there are lots of situations in React where uh, we, we run into frustration with it. Um, context allows us to define state and updaters at the top of level of our application or some are higher in, in our application and inject uh, that at any level deep. So here's how it works. Uh, we have two parts. We have the provider and we have the consumer. Um, the provider is going to be where your data lives and where your, your, your updater functions live. Um, and your consumer is going to be how we actually access that data at a lower level. So let's go ahead and kick off some code. So first thing we want to do is create a context. So you just make a new context with the create context method that we have on, inside of React. Um, and then inside of your application, you create what's called a provider. So here I'm creating a provider component. Um, and that provider component has a value prop where you, this is where you put all the data that's accessed. The value prop can be used to pass down any type of data. So let's we take a look here. We've got some state in this component. Um, and then inside of that provider, instead of just passing down a string, here I'm passing down an object. Uh, and inside of that object, I have all of our state, as well as any functions that are used to update that piece of state. Um, then we take that provider and we insert it into our application. So uh, again, anywhere, it might be at the top level of a component tree or it might be at an application level, as long as this is higher than you actually need access to it. Um, and then when you actually need uh, your access to your data, the provider makes sure that it is sort of in the air. I like to think that it's available to the application. And then to go ahead and grab that data is you use something that's called a consumer. Um, so remember, we uh, created this context right here. Um, generally, what you want to do is you want to export that um, context and make a uh, consumer out of that variable. And then wherever you want access to your data, you just use that consumer. Um, <clears throat> the child of your consumer is a render prop, or I'm going to get to in a, a further slide, we're also going to look at how you can use something called hooks now in React to access the data of your context. So here's how it would look. You have your consumer, um, and then the direct child of your consumer will be a function that gives you access to your state as well as your updater functions. There's no need to pass it down many levels deep. It's simply just available to you anytime that you uh, inject a consumer into a component. So I think that's pretty sweet. Um, it alleviates a lot of the problems that we may have with React, um, where people were maybe unnecessarily reaching for third-party plugins just so they could have the injection of data uh, at a lower level. Um, context isn't for everything, but uh, because a couple notes that we have here is prop drilling isn't necessarily all that bad. React is designed. I talked about that. That's by default. It's designed like that. Um, and then it's it's less self-contained. So. Um, as soon as you use a consumer in a uh, component, you are assuming that there is a provider at a higher level without having to pass that data in. So it's just something to be aware about, um, about the movability and portability of your components. Um, third, uh, sometimes prop drilling is just a result of, of bad design. So uh, Dan Abramov, who's one of the developers of, of React and Redux, um, showed this little pattern on, on Twitter here where uh, people don't necessarily know that, of course, you can pass data as a prop, but you can also pass components as props. So um, in this case, you have user in this, comp this state, um, and you can pass it down one, two, three levels deep via passing a prop, which in turn has its own prop. Um, I found it to be extremely helpful in sort of medium-sized applications where uh, passing the state is too cumbersome and state management is unnecessary. Um, it's generally the first thing that I reach for in a new application uh, when I ask myself, how do I wish to, to manage my data? Next one is fragments. Um, fragments let us return multiple elements from a component. This one is very simple, but very helpful. Um, a problem that we have right now is if you return two components or two elements from a component, you get this problem that says you cannot return adjacent elements. They must be wrapped, wrapped in a parent tag. So the solution was just wrap that sucker in a div and, and call it a day. Um, but th those extra divs are unnecessary and they can goof up your CSS that is um, maybe dependent on parent child, like Flexbox and Grid, direct descendant selectors, all of those go out the window when you have to put these 
unnecessary divs into your application. Um, so if we've got an example here, I've got a grid where it's got some style in it. This could be any sort of CSS. And then you have children. And then inside of your grid, you maybe have items. You notice how that I've wrapped this unnecessary div right here. And what that's doing is it's um, you're taking away the parent-child relationship between the grid and the grid items. And now all of a sudden your items is just one child. And then inside of that is, um, is your actual items. That's a bit frustrating for any CSS. So fragments is very simple. I just like to call them ghost elements. They render out to nothing. Um, and if you need to return two adjacent elements, you wrap them in a react.fragment tag. You can also wrap them in a, just a fragment tag if you import fragment directly from React. Or as of Babel 7, uh, you can now just render out um, empty tags and those will, will render out to nothing at all. Um, and that will take care of all the issues that we have. Um, I did spend way too long trying to import the fragment as a ghost because I like to think of them as ghost elements. Um, and uh, frustrating enough, you can't use emoji as, um, as like a variable name in JavaScript which sucks, so you don't try to do that. <laughs> Although you could probably make a custom Babel plugin if you wanted. I think that'd be cool to see. Uh, next up, we have error boundaries. Um, and error boundaries, uh, the catch errors that are thrown in child components. So uh, let's take a look at an example right here. We've got a leaky component that has state. We have an increment. Um, and then when it renders, we throw some sort of error. That's just showing that maybe something would, could, could go wrong, right? Um, <clears throat> um, and what we do now is you can create these what are called error boundaries in React. And uh, error boundaries can have the special lifecycle method called component did catch. Um, and anytime a child of an error boundary throws an error, uh, you'll be able to actually catch that error, much like a try catch in, in regular programming. Um, and then you can do whatever you want with that error. In our, in our case, what I'm doing is I'm setting that error to state, um, and then I'm going ahead and displaying to the user that there is an actual error. Um, and what that, ha what that allows us to do is if a component breaks, um, by default, it would just propagate all the way to the top and break the entire application. Whereas here, if you know that um, something is going to break, maybe it, or, or maybe something that just, just breaks unnecessarily, like a a method that wasn't defined or a piece of data you're expecting to be there wasn't there or any type of error that could happen in your application. You can wrap it in error boundary and, and gracefully handle that sort of error. Um, so here's an example of how you would actually do it. This is our leaky component that throws the error. You wrap it in error boundary and that will render out, oops, something went wrong. Um, it catches errors in render and lifecycle hooks only. Um, and the point of the error boundaries is to be able to display something to the user when, when things break. Um, it doesn't catch event handlers um, because uh, render doesn't depend on them. So if something happens when someone clicks something, um, that's not part of what an error boundary will catch uh, because you can catch those with try catch. Um, and then also errors thrown in the error boundary aren't caught. So if you want to error boundary your error boundary, you need an error boundary error boundary. And I don't know how deep you can go, but uh, just <laughs> to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> you may be asking, like, like why, would, why is this a special thing? Like, we have try-catch in, in programming in general. Um, and the reason behind this is because, like, render in, in JSX in general in React is declarative. Um, and it's not imperative. So we don't like, we can't wrap a try catch around um, a function called show family members. So we, we wrap a uh, error boundary around our declarative JSX components. Next up, we have the new refs API. This isn't all that exciting, but it's good to know just for the few times that you need to reach out. Um, what are refs in React are sort of an escape hatch for accessing DOM elements. Sort of like one of the golden rules of React is don't touch the DOM, meaning that like you shouldn't go back to your old jQuery ways and try to grab an element and attach event listeners and uh, grab data elements off of it. But in some cases, you do need to do that because you've got uh, maybe a third-party plugin that doesn't have a React equivalent or any time. Like if you go and get the like React Google Maps or or the React Vimeo, 
Um, if you look at any of these plugins under the hood, they actually do have to grab an iframe or a div at the end of the day because that's how these things work. Um, <clears throat> so helpful, like I said, they're helpful for performing DOM API methods, integrating third-party libraries. Charting is a really popular one for this. jQuery UI, if you've got uh, an, a legacy application that's still running on some jQuery UI, you still need to be able to interface with that sort of thing. Uh, and then animations is another big one as well. So back in the day, you had to do this terrible syntax where you have like a, um, a ref function where you, it gives you the input and then you, on, on the return, you set it to an input. Um, and then you can access the actual DOM element uh, via this.myInput. It was very confusing um, and frustrating for a lot of people. Um, so the new refs API will uh, allow us to just create a ref inside of a, a class, or you can also do this via the new hooks API as well. Um, and then anytime you want to access, like let's say I have this input right here and I want to be able to access that input, I simply just pop the ref on there. Um, and then anytime I uh, access the ref, I can simply do this dot my element. So a really good example of this is when you're trying to focus an element or if you just want to pull the value out of a one-time thing. Um, it's pretty common in React to uh, capture the key up or, or the, the key events and then stick the value of an input into your state. Um, and then when you want to submit a function, you have that data in state. Um, but in some cases, you don't necessarily need that data to be live in state. You just need it when you submit the form or something like that. Um, and if that's the case, you can use a ref and go ahead and grab that input and, and pull it out. Focusing is another good one. That is a DOM element. And if you need to be able to focus uh, an input, you, you got to reach for a ref or some sort of other plugin that will use refs under the hood. Um, here's just the code uh, that lives, that was running those two buttons. So get value is just alerts this.myInput.current.value. So this is the, the class. My input is the ref. Dot current is the uh, actual DOM element itself. And then once you're past there, it's just regular JavaScript, uh, vanilla JS, so dot value. And in this case, I'm calling dot focus, which is just a vanilla JS method. Um, use with care, you probably don't want to ref. Um, like I said, you can just mirror your state. Sorry, this is a little bit goofy. It's hard to read, but it's really easy just to mirror um, the name of an input to the value of the input in state. Um, it's pretty simple. And then there's lots of really good uh, libraries out there for if you're specifically working with form inputs. Uh, next little piece that we have here is portals. Um, I spent a long time on, on positioning this just right, although it doesn't work properly on uh, the size I have my screen right here, but hopefully you appreciate that. Um, not every website is 100% built in React. So um, it's sometimes easy to think like, oh yeah, like uh, if you're building a React website, you need your rotor in React and you need absolutely everything in React. And the reality is, is uh, maybe you just have a piece of your, your website that's built in React. Maybe there's a specific complex piece of interaction that needs to happen and you've opted for building the entire website in Laravel server rendered and you just want this one piece done in React. That's a pretty common use case. Even Facebook itself is rendered that way. Facebook is not a single page application. Um, <clears throat> so uh, React is often used for components on a website. So let's like take a look at a website. You got the gray, which is your server rendered uh, application. Uh, and then you have this like purple, which is your React application. The question comes like, what happens when I want to put a little piece of React that is outside of the React application? And um, this primarily shows itself in, in two use cases. One, like I'm showing you here, I've got a React application, but maybe maybe it's like a shopping cart, but I also want to show like the total of their shopping cart in the top right-hand corner. Um, and second is modals in React. So if you are working inside of a very deep level component, how do you show a modal dialog box where you just pop it open and it's, it's relative to the body and it's fixed position over top of the entire body? Um, and uh, two really great use cases are, are those. And we can use uh, portals in order to sort of escape um, the React application that we have and go to another piece of uh, the HTML page that is not necessarily managed by React. So here's how it works. Um, <clears throat> Here's a little example that I'm, I'm talking about here. The purple 
is my React application and the you have 16 items in your cart that is also uh, working in React. So the way that it works is that uh, you have two elements that are on your page. You have your regular React application root. This is where you mount your application. Um, almost always, this is just an empty div that you load on your page. Um, and then your React application will be injected into that single page. Um, and then the elements uh, that live outside of the React application. So um, this might be uh, the piece that is in your, your navigation bar. We call that outside L. Um, and uh, you go ahead and select that. So we have our two elements. Um, now, this is where you create your portal. I'm going to call mine portal to another dimension. Um, and uh, what happens is that uh, when it's created in your constructor, you create an empty div. Um, and when it mounts, you take that element and append it to your outside element. So now we're taking this internal div that we've created and sticking it outside of the DOM or outside of our React DOM and putting it into just the regular HTML DOM. Um, and then when we remove the component, we also just clean up after ourselves. And then we return a portal which will uh, take any children that are passed to the portal. So anything that gets sucked into the portal will be sucked out of the, the other portion. So whatever comes in, this.props.children, will be put out into uh, whatever goes out in the this.l. Um, so here I have a very simple React application where the cart has an empty array. Um, and then every time someone adds an item to cart, we're simply just adding an object which has a title and a price. So I'm just adding additional elements to it. Um, now, here's where uh, the portal sort of comes in handy. Um, if you have a regular React application where you have your paragraph tags, you have your buttons to add items to cart, you're listing all of your items in the cart, now you want to display that little, little piece that was up in the corner of the menu bar. Um, you simply just use this portal to another dimension component, and anything that gets passed into the portal doesn't show up in this component, but it gets whisked away into wherever you have set that thing to go up. So again, I'll just show you this just for visual sake, how you're able to uh, take any data. Um, and the beauty of that is that you don't have to manually update spans and things like that, that you might have to do with normal JavaScript. You get all the benefits of um, the immediate updating and, and everything that you've, you're used to. Uh, via portals. All right, next is time for the two big ones, which is suspense and hooks. Um, <clears throat> suspense is going to be coming soon to React. Um, it's still very much under development. Um, it is currently only in React for um, the code split bundles, um, and it is not for data fetching. So. Um, this might change. It might change totally, um, but it's still very much under development. Um, they're saying Q2 of, or, or they said mid-2019 is when it will be coming out. So uh, this is sort of just a look ahead as to what you can expect coming um, from a, a data fetching standpoint. So React Suspense is all about waiting for things to load before you go ahead and render out your component. Uh, so some examples are uh, code split bundles. So if you've got a shopping cart or you have a user management screen and those shopping cart or the user management screen, they need code in order to run. And you might not necessarily want to bundle that like shopping cart JS and user JS on the homepage when the person loads the homepage because they're maybe a bit larger than you would hope it's, and it's not necessarily needed. However, you do need the shopping cart at JS when somebody adds an item to cart or when somebody goes to the shopping cart page or, or you may need the user.js uh, when, when somebody uh, tries to edit their, edit their, um, their username or their, their avatar or something like that. So uh, wh what needs to happen is that when somebody uh, clicks through to that page, you need to on demand load that um, JavaScript sort of behind the scenes and you can't show any UI until that, that code split bundle has actually been loaded. Um, another really good example, and this is probably the bulk of it, is data fetching. So um, if you need to uh, view a component, you want to view like a, um, a user component, you first need to fetch the data of that user before you can come back and show the UI for the user uh, to edit their data, right? 
Um, finally, image sources. Sometimes you want to wait for the entire image to load before you actually display some uh, UI to the user. So with React Suspense, it's a way to sort of suspend or pause uh, rendering of a component while we're waiting for asynchronous data to load. Um, because the way that data loads in JavaScript, it's, it's asynchronous. Um, it's, it's sort of hard to wait for data to, to be loaded before we can go ahead. And a lot of times in PHP world, you just wait for the data and then you return your, your data below or you return your, your template below that. Um, with, with JavaScript, we often have to have these sort of like loading screens. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we, we currently do this in the React world. Um, so I've got a class that has some state inside of it. I've got the user, which is empty, and I have a loading Boolean, which is set to true. Um, and then when the component mounts, I'm going to go ahead and fetch that user from the API. And then when that data comes back, I'm awaiting it. So that will sort of like pause that function from running and stick it into user. Um, and then when that data comes back, I will set that to state and turn off the loading Boolean. Then we go down to our render, how we display it. Um, we destructure that. So we, we get our user and we get our loading variables that are from state. And we first, we check if we're loading. And if we are, we show a spinner or something like that. Uh, and then finally, if we're not loading, then we return the actual div that has the user in it, uh, the user management screen. So uh, this works kind of OK, but uh, the loader UI and the data fetching always have to live in the same component. Um, and, and that's a bit frustrating because uh, often you go to a website that is built in, in any of these single page application frameworks, and you see like six or seven spinners go off. And then very slowly, or over the next one or two seconds, you see them stream in their data, and the data all po populates over, and all those spinners go away. Um, and, and that's a little bit frustrating to the user, because they see like all this jank on the website where it's just kind of uh, re-rendering over and over and over again. So React Suspense will decouple where you wait for your data um, and where you show your, your actual loading UI. Um, so a React Suspense component placeholder component will be able to detect if any of its children in the component tree are, are loading data. And this means that um, at a very high level or at a component level or wherever it is that you want, you'll be able to detect if any of the children are currently trying to fetch data. Um, and then at a higher level, you're able to uh, make some decisions as to what UI you should show to the user. Um, <clears throat> another kind of cool thing about React Suspense is that you will be able to uh, avoid showing loaders earlier or earlier than necessary on fast connections. So uh, that's another, like we talk a lot about slow connections and, and showing UI, but also on fast connections, sometimes you go to a website and you have a really fast connection and you see for like 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, you see just all these different loaders all over the place where it probably didn't need to happen. We probably could have shown nothing. And then when everything was perfectly ready, we could have just brought in the full ready application to the user without having to have any of that sort of in-between re-renders. So let's look at some what some of the code looks like. Um, first thing is that you need to do is create a cache. Now, this is um, I, I suspect that we will see a lot of different kinds of caches come out. I suspect we will see like an Apollo cache come out. Um, and uh, right now, the only one that's out is called React Cache. Um, and that's somewhere where it's going to cache your data. You go ahead and, and create a cache. This is not that really important. Um, then, this is kind of an important part, uh, you create what's called a resource. Now, you take your asynchronous functions that go off and fetch your data. Uh, in this case, it's just an async function that hits an API and returns that data. So you take all of your existing API calls and you wrap them in this new create resource function. That's going to be imported from a future version of React. And you've turned your async functions into just these user resources or, or uh, shopping cart resource. Um, then um, you simply just go ahead and read that data. This is going to be very, uh, this is, I think this will feel nice to all of you PHP developers, where uh, when you go for a render, you simply just read the data that you want, and then 
return the JSX and you turn the templates that you, you wish to, to have, right? So there's no like waiting, there's no checking for loading Booleans or anything like that. You simply just read the data, you pass it your cache variable because if that resource has already been uh, put in the cache, it will just immediately resolve itself. Uh, and then you return your, your template from there. Um, nice and clean, no need to, to do any sort of asynchronous hooks or, or anything like that. Um, the user resource.read will block the render function um, and it will only block that specific render until the data is resolved. Um, you can also call preload on a resource and what that will do is you can call that at any time and that will go ahead and preload the content. So uh, imagine you have like a, you're doing a classifieds website and someone's swiping through the different classifieds. You might want to preload the next two or three classifieds so that when someone's swiping through them, there, it feels nice and snappy and there's no unnecessary loading. Um, and I'm really excited about this because React up until now has been very, um, they don't care how you handle your data. They just say it, they're, they're more about how you display the data. Um, and now that they're coming in with this opinionated way on how to actually load your data, um, I think it's going to make our lives a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> So the question might be like, that's nice. You just read the data from the cache and then you went ahead and used it. Um, but uh, where is the actual loading state? Uh, and that's where the suspense component comes in. So you take your component, in this case, user, or has, a, has a user, has a resource being fetched inside of it. And you wrap that in a suspense component um, anywhere you want. I'll show you more examples in a second. Then inside of that suspense component, you pass it two things. First, you give it a fallback. And the fallback will determine what UI should I show if this thing is in loading state. Uh, and then we have the max duration, which will determine um, how long should I show nothing um, for. And that's really helpful for fast connections where maybe for the first, in this case, I said two seconds, that's probably too much, but maybe for the two, first 200, 300 milliseconds, if the data is still being fetched for 300 milliseconds, show nothing at all. Don't throw up a spinner or anything like that because the user is okay with that. Um, however, if we go past that to 2,000 milliseconds, then go ahead and show this fallback UI, which will give the user some sort of indication, whether it's a loader or a skeleton screen, something like that, that shows the user that something is happening. Um, so some important notes about this, um, a placeholder can be placed anywhere you want to show the loading UI. Um, so in our case, look down here is the user component that fetches the data. And I've put my suspense component up here. Um, and what that will do is it allow us to hide all of the header and any other uh, markup that is, is being shown. We don't have to just throw a loader underneath the user profile screen. We can block the entire thing out or show a skeleton screen for the entire thing until the entire page has been loaded or until that entire component has been loaded. Um, another cool thing about this is a placeholder, or it's called a suspense component now, um, can have as many children as you could possibly want. So in this case, I have a suspense component that has three pieces of uh, data being fetched, a user component, a custom image, and a code split bundle. And we wait for all three of those things to resolve their data fetching uh, before we actually go ahead and, and render out the screen. Again, after two, se two seconds, if it's still fetching data on a slow connection, then we'll render out a loader. Um, I've got a loader here. Um, I believe I can show you what the example looks like. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so, um, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a max duration of three seconds. And actually, I'm going to make that two seconds. And then I'm going to make a, uh, a three second request. So by making a three second request, it should show nothing for two seconds. And then for one second, it should show my fallback spinner. So I'm going to click it. One, two, quick spinner. And then the resource has been loaded in, in three seconds, showing me there. Um, again, I could jack that up to four seconds. One, two, three, four. Shows me a loader for one second and then goes off. So we have that kind of balance between 
uh, not showing anything as well as showing a spinner or some sort of loading UI. Last piece that we have here is on hooks. Um, hooks are in React as of, I think, two or three weeks ago. Uh, so it's something you can go ahead and start using now. Um, and hooks are a new way to write state and other React features without having to write classes. So it's a, it's a way for us to add stateful data and stateful logic to our components um, without having to necessarily use classes and, and mix all that together. So let me show you an example. The current problem that we have is that you start off with a what's called a stateless functional component, and uh, they've now been renamed in React to just function components. Uh, a function component in React is just a function that returns some JSX, um, and that's good. But if if you need to add like some state to that component, you have to convert it from a function component to a class-based component, and then you add your state, you add an updater function, and then you go ahead and uh, render out that component with the state in it. And then you say, oh, cool, but I also need lifecycle methods. Um, lifecycle methods are often used for what we call side effects, meaning that like you reach outside of the component and you do something, whether you're updating the page title or maybe you are synchronizing with an external database. Um, we have these kind of three big ones in React, which is component did mount. That's when it the component mounts to the screen. Um, we have did update, which is when the component updates itself. Um, and we have unmount, which is when the component is removed from screen. So at those three points, we need to communicate externally to uh, databases or services or something else on the page that we need to, to run. Um, and then you realize, oh, I need some uh, other stuff too. So uh, here I have in my component did update, I've got two pieces of logic. I've got my database subscription, and I've got a little bit of logic based on, on the age and, and setting some state. And um, this is where things get to be a little bit hairy because um, we've got two pieces of logic and I've stuffed them and they're totally unrelated. And I've just stuffed them both into this component did update lifecycle method. So Hooks is aiming to allow us to take that sort of complexity and to put them into their own functions um, so that they both don't have to necessarily be attached to what they look like. Um, because like, it's never great when, when you have to make a component and what it looks like, how, what the template is, and the data that it holds are, are melded together. Because what happens if you want the same look but different data or different data in the same look, right? So <clears throat> this is what hooks are going to allow us to do. It's a bit of a, a new way to, to approach looking at these, these applications. So I've got this use state hook. This is going to be one of the hooks that's baked into React, or it is baked into React. You pass it your default state. In this case, it's just a number zero. Um, and that will return to us an array of two things. The first thing in the array is the piece of state directly. And the second thing is um, the updater function. Uh, and the reason why they use an array here is so that you can destructure that array and name them whatever you want. Um, so if it was destructured via an object, it would just be like a name called state and um, a name called updater. But because it's index-based, then we can destructure them and we can call them whatever we want. So I, I'm calling mine age and update age. Then you can just go below inside of the return and use that piece of state as well as run the updater function on click. Um, it works with context well as well. So remember I told you about that, uh, the, the render prop function. Um, the new simple context is we simply just say use context. That will put the data into my context and then I can go ahead and use that context right inside of my component. There's no render prop or uh, weird things that need to happen there. Uh, use effect is good for lifecycle methods and side effects. So um, <clears throat> the way that uh, side effects work is you can um, run a function, and the function that you pass to use effect will run when the component mounts as well as whenever the component updates itself. So uh, what's kind of interesting about that is that you pass it an array of dependencies. And whenever that array of dependencies changes, in our case, I'm just changing the number of clicks, then that, will, that function will run. Um, and then if you also want to run a cleanup function when that component is removed, 
you return a function from that function and that will uh, that will run on on unmount. So that covers our three sort of lifecycle methods that we previously had there. Um, one other thing I want to say real quick, I forgot to say about state is that um, you might think like, well, every time the simple counter runs, doesn't the state get reset back to zero? Because that's the way functions work. They get, when they run, they are just run fresh and then that's done, right? Uh, however, use state under the hood will memoize the data so that the first time that use state gets called here, it will create a new piece of state. But the second time that this get called, it will remember that it had been called previously and that piece of state will, will still be living uh, under the hood in React. So we can uh, keep this age, no matter how many times this function runs, we'll be able to keep that state um, over and over again. Um, you can use custom hooks. So one of the kind of cool things about um, hooks is you can use hooks in hooks, uh, meaning that uh, here, what I've done is I was, actually, this is a perfect after the last one. I was using a WebSocket uh, example, and I was li listening for data from the WebSocket. And when data comes streaming in from the WebSocket, I needed to display that data on the screen. Um, so in my case, it was just status. It was a status. It was actually from a little drone. And the, the status of the drone was streaming in via a WebSocket. So what I did is I... Uh, use state, and by default, it is disconnected. I put that into my status, and then I went ahead um, and have an update status function. Then from this custom hook, I returned the status so that inside of my other component, I can simply just say, use socket. Um, however, there, there's a, a third piece of the pie that needs to happen here, and that is I need to actually listen to the socket for any updates, and I also need to remove my listener when this thing was removed from the page. So um, I have this use effect here, and I say, when the socket gets a status, uh, status event from the, from the WebSocket server, then simply just run the update status function, and that's going to set state um, in, into the status variable here. Um, and then when the person removes this component, that is being used, then simply just remove the listener so you don't accidentally, because what could happen is if you're mounting and unmounting these effects all the time and you're not properly cleaning up after yourself, um, you can run into memory leak because you've added all these event listeners and you've never removed them and you can have memory leaks or you can have like multiple listeners that are streaming in multiple pieces of data and that's a bit of a headache. So always make sure to clean up after yourself. So what time is it? Perfect timing. Awesome. So that is it. Uh, React is, is evolving. Um, I think it's for the better, both the DX developer experience, but also UX, the user experience. Specifically, that suspense stuff, I think, is going to make our UIs a lot nicer for, um, for our users to work with. Um, most of these are additions, not necessarily changes. They're going to be making our applications better. Um, hopefully, you have learned a thing or two. I don't have stickers. Sorry, I left that in from the last time I did this talk. This is Unless you're in my office here, you can come get them, but otherwise I don't. Um, uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. If you have any, I'd love to, to field some of those. All right, I'm back. I'll take a sticker. I'm coming over. All right, come on down. <laughs> um, I don't have any questions right here that I think are going to be communicable over this. So. Uh, I think we'll leave it there, but I appreciate you coming All on. Right. This. I think um, it's kind of interesting because there's like the two groups of the Laravel world, like definitely view heavy on the one hand, but then it doesn't seem people talk about this. Like a lot of react out there too, more than I think I would have suspected even. So, um, and it's really cool. One of the things that I've seen recently is just when hooks came out, like there's instantly like a view kind of implementation and how these kind of ecosystems feed off each other. It, within yeah, the, that's great. It's kind of interesting. And uh, with just the speed, the pace of kind of innovation in this area is unbelievable. Awesome. Yeah, man. All right. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you later. All right, later.